I don't know which way the Lord's going to go. I know I always say that, right? But it's the truth. I don't. <laughs> I don't know exactly what direction. I have a, a little slight idea, but I do know that he wants to, uh, wanted me to talk about headship. Uh, but before I do, I like to uh, thank the Lord for my father being here today. And as I thought about headship, I thought about three men that the Lord had put in my life. My first being my father. And when I was a little girl, I remember my daddy. I had so many memories that come up just Saturday, or maybe it was, no, it was Friday. And uh, I was thinking about my dad and all these thoughts start coming. And some of them, you know, maybe I, I just didn't think about how precious those moments and those thoughts were. I found myself crying because I was thinking about my daddy when I was little and he was working. He worked so hard to provide for us as a family. And when he would go to work and he would come home in the evening, I would run to the court. When he would come down to court, I would run so hard. And, and it was, I don't know, it was just something special about greeting my daddy when I was a little girl. And, um, you know, I just looked forward to when he would come home from work. And then I thought about another time that... Um, he would take me to church. My mama would get me all dressed up, and I would go to church with my dad, and we would walk to church. And I remember when I was little when they would pass the plate in the church, and they had the metal plates with the green velvet bottom, and I used to reach my hand in there trying to take the money out, not put the money <laughs> But when you're a real little church, you're like a big place, you know. And so, but I remember those times when I would go to church with my daddy. And that those were special times. So you look back and years have gone by. I, and the images of my daddy praying uh, at night, I don't think sometimes he saw, he knew that I, I saw him do that. But consistently... And whenever I would get in my dad's car, he always, every day, had his Bible, you know. And uh, those things now mean so much to me, you know. He wasn't perfect, but he was a, an example. And I remember him telling over the years, saying how he would pray to God, that God, if you would just helped me to strengthen me that I could provide for my family. And I've seen my daddy sacrifice, you know, uh, things that he probably desired and needed, you know, for us, you know, so that he could just run and take care of the household. And when I got grown and moved out on my own, even my mom, it, it just hit me, everything that they have done for me, how they sacrifice, you know, how they love me, you know, and took care of us, you know, and the things that they, not considering what it cost them. And so I said in my heart, I said, when they, I'm going to be a blessing to my family. And that was my heart's desire, to be a blessing because of what they sacrificed and what they had meant to me. And I appreciate the example that my father looked to God and asked God, and you know what? That's in the word of God. In my studying for today, I saw that. The fathers were the providers. Amen. But there's a lot of fathers 
that don't provide for their families. A lot of fathers that walk out on their family, walk out on their home, you know, don't care whether the child have a, a, a food on the table or clothes on the back. They just don't have no concern. And it's sad what our society, where our society has come from because it's not the uh, understanding of how important the family is and that God ordained that structure. Amen. Some fathers don't know, didn't know how to treat their wives and abuse the mom and the, and the children suffer. And the patterns they leave is, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to paint a bad picture, but I'm just saying when you have a father that's a godly man, that's a Christian that's trying to do the best he can to serve God and to minister to his family, it's a blessing. And we shouldn't take that for granted. And the whole idea is because God designated men as the head. Amen. Amen. And the prescription is all through the word if you want to prosper. You have to submit to your head. And I don't mean being under their feet because we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Headship means... Uh, having rule and dominion. And in our society, those are negative words when, it come, when you come to talk about the family. The husband having dominion, the, uh, the husband having rulership. You know, we, we, it's, it's got twisted. It has gotten twisted because it was something that God created and the purpose he created and the motivation for him creating it and giving man dominion was because of love. It was because of love. It wasn't to show how strong he was, how he could control. It wasn't to uh, lift him up in pride, but it was the purpose was the father's was to show God's love Amen. to his family. Amen. So we are talking about headship today. Um, it is uh, it's an honor to be given leadership and headship of someone or something. That's an honor from God. Headship given uh, to Adam from God in Genesis 1.26. I like to take us there. Because God gave Adam purpose, gave him identity, gave him significance. If you go to Genesis 1.26... This was, um, the idea of headship was given by God. Then, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth, God gave man dominion. Amen. To rule it, to govern it. Amen. To make sure it was operating in its order. 
you know, the, the birds. He gave them dominion over the birds. He gave them to make sure they were protected. Amen? So, before I go on with that, I want to say I give honor to my late husband, uh, Herbert Collins, that God used him to stretch me, to grow me up, and to bless our family, to bless my, my children. And I thank God for his legacy. I thank God for his life. You know, he left a pattern of achievement for his sons. You know, he was a pioneer in a lot of political efforts for the city. He was, um, he fought for our rights, you know, to be able to vote and have somebody that we can put in office. You know, he sued the city for um, the war system. Uh, he sued the city for a lot of things. <laughs> but he won. Amen. And, and, and that's, you know, you can't take those things for granted. And I don't. And, um, but through um, my our marriage and relationship with him, he, it caught, because I was a shy kind of, uh, not an aggressive person, uh, but being attached to him, he stretched me because I was, had to be in a position where I would be among people, dignitaries, and, and, uh, and those were things I would shy away from. But God had us, he had us, so I was just like, God, why? You know, why? But it was my head. So I had to follow him. Amen? And uh, I, we found, I, I found myself in places I never thought I would be, but that was that experience, and I thank God for him. He loved his family. You know, uh, we weren't without issues. It wasn't perfect. But... He was a good man. Amen. And then lastly, I thank God for my present husband. My daddy. <laughs> my friend. My counselor. <laughs> I thank God for his example. I thank God he's a good father to his children. And I thank God that in his life I see the pattern that God had intended in this book. And I know that God, you know, loves that. Because that's what he intended for the father to be a pattern of good works. A pattern of uh, Love, security, protection, these are all the things that God provided for us through the Father because that's what he is to us. Amen? So I thank the Lord for my husband being those things, and I can't thank God enough for him. Um, he's faithful and committed to God. And uh, he even admitted the other day to me, he said, you know, the Lord spoke to me and said, I need to have some balance. <laughs> he might not want me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that, you know, he's, he's open, he's honest. Yeah. He's honest about his feelings. Uh, we can throw off on each other, and, and I don't mean in a negative sense, I mean bounce things off. And uh, he listens. He listens. You know, and because he, he listens, you know, I feel secure in who, my, who I am. He, is a, he affirms me. You know, it's, it's, he affirms his daughters. He affirms uh, my son. 
And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. That's a good thing. But uh, now I'm going back to Genesis 126. I'm not going to be very long. I promise you. I just want to get some points over about headship so you can go out and enjoy your fathers. We're going to pray for the fathers of the day. We're going to have the families pray for their fathers. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So Genesis 126 uh, reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. How he is. In essence, in being, in purpose, in desire. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And God wanted them to fill the earth with their like-mindedness, with the image that they were in him, his image in them, perpetrating the kingdom of God. Amen. But something happened in the garden, and we know that story. But, excuse me, my eyes. Okay, God, um, God ordained the family. God backs family order. The verses I just read is a cornerstone of the biblical understanding of man's image of God. The image of God is presented first and foremost in the relationship to a unique social or community concept of God. God is a triune God, and he talks about um, unity in that trinity, okay? He said, let us make man. Many scholars interpret this use of both the single and plural as an allusion to the trinity, one God, yet a community of persons. God then proceeds to create man in his own image. At this all-important beginning point, Scripture highlights a particular aspect of man's nature, namely that which corresponds to the social or community aspect of God's nature. God creates man as male and female. Not a solitary individual, but two people. Yet as we read on, we discover that the two are nevertheless one. That's God's whole idea, is the unity of a husband and wife uh, and the woman coming in, su in submission. And I was listening to a teaching on Cref uh, by Creflo Dollar, and it was so astounding that I, I had to meditate on that thing. And he said this, God is creator, and he made us, he made fathers and men as creators after his image and likeness. But God spoke, when he created the universe, the sea, the oceans, and the heavenlies, the animals, God spoke and said, let there be, right? He didn't create that. He spoke it, and then out of himself, because he's the source of all living, out of himself, he said, let us make man after our image and likeness. And so Creflo uh, went on to say that whatever God creates, Whatever atmosphere he created that thing in, if he created man, 
create them out of dust, the ground, out of the earth. So that, the atmosphere that he creates, um, create a man in, it has to sustain man. Okay? So the earth, man is sustained by uh, cultivating the land, the, the uh, uh, vegetation, so he can be sustained, right? He can't live without food, amen? amen? So the earth has to sustain man. So in the same way, man, because he's created and he come out of God, God has to sustain man. Man cannot function without God. Amen? That thing, I said, oh, yeah. I said, that's good right there. That's good. Everything that God created in the atmosphere he created in, it has to sustain it. Amen? And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because fathers... do the same thing. They are created by God in his image and his likeness to sustain their families. Amen. If you look at our society, when men have lost their place of headship, our society is deteriorating. Our families are distraught. They don't have direction. A lot of men don't have purpose and identity. They don't even know what they're about. Because the thing that sustained them, they have separated themselves from. Amen? Where their identity and purpose is, is in God. But if, that, uh, if God can't sustain them, they self-destruct. Right. So we see how important the headship is. Okay? Headship uh, given to Adam, he was cr created to rule, to have authority and dominion. Amen? It was an uh, it was in Adam's DNA, and it is the men's DNA to be head. Amen. It's an honor to be a head of something. In the natural order of things, men are considered head of their households to have dominion and to rule. And, and that doesn't mean rule them and abuse them. The dominion and rule that God gave the husbands uh, and fathers is to love them. And what happens with that, we think that because we don't, because men haven't found a true identity and purpose in God, God is love, right? Amen. So everything that God does, he's, he it's an act of his love. Okay? So when he give you to have rule and dominion over your families, he expects you to rule it in, with love. Right. Amen. Amen. It's to be sustained. It's to be protected. It's to be nourished. It's to be taught the things of God. Amen. Amen. In the natural order of things, men are considered head of their households to have dominion and rule, to be the spiritual thermostat of their families. Now we'll go to Ephesians 5.22. And Josephine was in my message a little bit, but that's okay. One spirit. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband's head, we're talking about headship, for the husband is head, 
He's the ruler. He's the chief of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in some things. Oh, what does that say? Let the wives be in subject to their own husbands in everything. I'm not going to mess today. I'm going to be... I'm going to be good. I'm going I'm to I'm share it like, uh, I'm going to share this thing like the Lord uh, made me see. God see his order. And I don't care how jacked up. That source is, God still see the order. If the woman respect the order and submit to it, God can change the order. Amen. And, it, and God is, is love. If you submit to him, he's going to protect you. If you submit to him, he'll put pressure on the man to line up the way he's supposed to. But it takes the submission, pulling yourself down instead of trying to go. Having a boxing match to show up, well, just as strong as you. You're going to get killed. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> but if you humble yourself as unto the Lord, he'll take care of it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I used to remember uh, going to Paula sometime, and I remember uh, two men, where they were, I guess they come off their job at work, they worked for the city, and they were sitting at a table, and man, one man was crying the blues about his wife. <laughs> she don't cook. <laughs> she don't clean up the house. Come home, your head toe up. And they were just going back and forth. And I said, oh, my God. I didn't know men talk like that, you know. But I, I, I guess he was pouring his heart out so that he can get some consolation from his friend. But the friend won't help him too much. And that's why I thank God for the men of God. I thank God for the men of God because you're in a place where you can understand the ways of God. It's not easy being ahead. And sometimes men are more submissive to the wife. More submitted to the wife because you know what? The the, uh, the wife said, honey, uh, what do you want to have for dinner? Oh, anything. Whatever you cook. But when you ask the husband, uh, uh, the husband asks the wife, uh, what about having so-and-so? Oh, we had that yesterday. Uh, uh, <laughs> It's so easy to say, oh, honey, whatever you want to do, that's okay. Submitting. 
Submitting is not a bad thing. It's just uh, keeping unity. And submission is keeping harmony in the relationship. When your husband say, honey, I think we should do so and so and so. Well, why we got to do that? <laughs> Just humbly say, okay, honey, I'm going to respect my head. If you want to do it that way, okay, that's fine. Amen. <laughs> Saints, I'm going to tell you something. You, if you will, if we as women will humble ourselves, I ain't, I'm not hogging on you women because it's Father's Day, but I'm just telling you a principle that I learned. If you allow yourself to be in agreement with your mate, you can get more from him. than you would if you were always disagreeable, always contrary, always got to prove your point. You can get more from him. That's why submission is a beautiful thing. It gives you favor. You'll get favor from the Lord because that pleased God. Amen. And then on the same breath, men, Compliment your wife sometime. Listen to her complaints. Don't try to argue with her about whether she's right or wrong. Just, just listen and, and write some notes down and think about it. You might find out that there are some underlying needs that maybe you neglected. Amen? But so God have given us head, the men headship. And we should let them have it. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It wasn't easy. Huh? Christ, he loved the church so much he got persecuted. He got falsely accused. Huh? He got called the devil. Life was threatened, but he kept his mission. He kept his purpose. He came with a purpose of bringing restoration to man that lost his place in God. He came to win back many sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. He laid down his life for it. And man, sometimes you got to lay down your life for that woman. I don't care how she's cutting up and acting up. You got to submit until God changes. it. Now, I found out God can change it two ways. He can save them or he can take them. He'll fix it now. When you submit it to God the way you're supposed to be, he'll change it one way or the other. And we'd rather him change it favorably for the spouse than to have to take her or him because they haven't submitted. Amen. Listen to Corinthians 8, 9 to 11. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. 
For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man and the Lord. Why? Because he called them to be one. Amen. One in purpose. One in... Um, uh, union with each other. God never called man and woman to be separated. It doesn't mean that the woman don't have her identity, but the submission part on the woman is she submits to the man. And if God is dealing with the woman, he will not, and, he, and she hear God speaking to her, and if her husband is in disagreement, He's not to overstep his boundaries with her independence because she's hearing from God. Amen. So there, there is some uh, grounds that uh, God allowed that the woman, because he made the woman to be a helpmate to the man. Amen. You know, so her, he affirms her. He nourishes her and teaches her. He loves her. He makes her feel secure, makes her feel uh, uh, that she has purpose and identity and that she can go out and conquer the world. That man's supposed to build her up, not to tear her down. And so, God, that's, uh, that's the purpose. It's, it's just like um, you, we take God, well, he will not overburden us. He will not overburden us. He will give us a yoke, but he will not give us overburden us. He will give us a yoke that will yoke us up with each other so that we can handle the weights and the cares for the family. But if we are bucking, that yoke gonna, it's going to hurt somebody. Amen. If it's not fitted properly, it's going to wear somebody down. So, But God designed it so both could carry the weight. Amen? And be fruitful. Y'all quiet on me, huh? You know, the man as a head is a source. And a source is, is something to, uh, is, oh, I'm sorry, source. It's the same kind growing into something to come into being. So the head is a source. The man is a head like Christ. Uh, man is the head like God. Um, the m first miracle that Jesus did, can anybody tell me? That wasn't the first miracle. But where was he at? That's it. Yeah. He performed his first miracle at a wedding. And it has some significance because God wants to bless the marriages. Yes. Amen? Yes. Everything God do, it, it, he got it planned out. Yes. It's purposed. You know, and some people, some of, some of the uh, young ladies I know in here, you are saying, well, that's all good, but I'm not interested. Yes, you are, because you know what? Your day. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why you're interested. Because the very thing, the pattern that your father present to you, you're going to do. Why? Because he's your source. He's the progenitor. He's the... I mean, let me uh, read that for you. A progenitor is from the Latin meaning to beget, to bring forth. 
It is also notes a, a precursor or originator. So your father is the originator of who you are. Amen. And you and and you can see this pattern in life when um, a son's father is a, a preacher or a teacher or a singer or a boxer. Guess what the children do? They go right into that same field. Why? Because it's a pattern. He's a precursor. Amen. All of them don't follow that pattern because they're not in alignment. Okay? But the father is the initiator of the events that will happen in their life. You know, so don't ever say what you won't do. Make sure you understand what your father has done. Amen. And if he's in, if he's in Christ, what he has done is going to affect you. And you might not see the ramifications of it now, but later on in life you're going to find that the very thing that you didn't want to do that your dad did, you probably end up doing. Amen. Amen. So this, why? Because there's principles. There are principles laid out by God for the family, for the structure. Amen. And for his kingdom. All right. Um, let's, I want to look at Psalms 8. All right. Psalm 8 says, O Lord our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you should visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. And where is he going to put a crown at? We're going to put the crown on the head of man. Amen. You, splendor, a uh, uh, definition of uh, honor is Hadar, and it means splendor, honor, glory, adornment, magnificence, beauty. Amen. It also means to glorify, to make splendid. Speaks of the splendor that belongs to God, to his creation, to his kingdom, and to man made in God's image. The biblical view of man is higher and more worth affirming than any other alternate views. Amen. In this reference, God had actually crowned man with splendor in spite of his smallness, amen, amen, relative to the vastness of heaven. You know, that's awesome. God said, you know, I know man. And because he's made in my image and likeness, I'm going to crown him with honor on these conditions that man abide in me and I abide in him. Amen. If I honor God and if you honor God, we can ask what we will. Amen. And the word say that will be done of our Father in heaven. We, gotta, we need to look again in the word of God and 
understand why God made man, why he made the fathers, why he, he uh, is so concerned about families, why he's so concerned about our, uh, our societies, why he, is he so concerned about the orphans. Amen. He made us, he, he made man the highest order. Father is the highest honor God bestows on man. The principles of fatherhood is that fathers provide identity. The measure of a man's success is directly related to his effectiveness as a godly father. That's good. When you can talk about your fathers and what he's done, his attributes, how he is, and you're always talking to you about your father, somebody want to know about him. They want to know something about him. And uh, it brings glory to God. His effectiveness as a godly father for which God is the ultimate standard and only true example. The source of sin is fatherlessness. There's so many children that are fatherless that even in gangs, they're trying to find purpose and identity because they don't have fathers. And they got to feel like they need to belong to somebody or something. And they don't have the positives to affirm them, so they go to the negatives of society. Because they just want to belong. Jesus came to fix uh, man's problem of fatherlessness. Salvation is the result of Jesus. The second item, providing us with a way to return to the Father and our original identity in him, according to Romans 5, 19. God has called man to be fathers like he is in order to turn the hearts to the children back to their fathers. If he don't, he'll, he said he will smite the earth with a curse. And I think we're seeing a lot of that. Amen. People are not being blessed. You know... If you're out of order with your dad, if you're out of relationship with him, um, if he's here and living, you need to make it right. Make it right. If you've been disobedient, things happening, you're not happy, you feel like the prodigal son, go make it right with your dad. Get things right. Get things right with your mom. Amen the things will go well with you. And if they're not here anymore, repent. Repent. Ask God to forgive you for whatever, for whatever rebellion, unforgiveness, whatever it might be, because it's affecting your life and your relationship and relationships. Amen. God has called man to be fathers like he is in order to turn their hearts of the children back to the fathers. If you understand the, this principle and apply it in your life, then God will answer your prayers for provisions because he will father you as you also father your family. If you seek God for provisions for your family, he will provide for you as you line yourself with, up with him. The level at which you, your uh, child's refer to you is a measure of your effectiveness as a father. Fathers are progenitors, the source that generates, supports, and upholds the coming generations. That's why men are so important. That's why your headship is important. Amen? Amen. Without a head, there's no uh, nourishment or growth is possible. No relationship with God if you don't. No relationship with God if you don't have a relationship with his word. You can't have a relationship with God outside of his word. The head of every man is Christ. The head of a woman is man. And... Um, And that uh, a man should have dominion. Amen. 
because of what Christ has done. Amen. For man and for the families. Amen. And I'm and at this I'm gonna conclude like this. I'm gonna ask the um, the fathers to come back up. <laughs>